Welcome to Inside Walls Prison Ministry as we grab a Bible study today that I consider one of my favorites. We're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 3. We've done chapter 1 and 2, and we're going to move on into 3. We'll be doing 4 and 5 in another lesson, but right now I just want us to focus on the fact that he brings the, the unbelief and, and the people needing to focus on who Christ is. We'll look at all of that in just a moment. One of the things about Hebrews, uh, the best way to categorize it is better. Um, he brings out in the epistle better than the angels, a uh, better promise, a better hope, a better testament, a better mediator, a better priesthood. And as we were talking before our study actually began, had it not been for Hebrews and what we're going to look at in chapter 4 and 5 of Melchizedek, uh, that set the entire different stage, changing it from the Levitical laws to the priesthood, of Christ. If you were to identify Hebrews, what would you say about it? Um, it's a letter to the Jews to remind them of all the things that happened in the Old Testament, showing that Christ was who he was in the New Testament. And that's basically who it was written to. It was written to the Hebrew people, the Jewish, and even if you're witnessing to somebody today, a Jew, um, don't start them in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Start them in the book of Hebrews, because it is in a dialect. It's in a pure uh, translation, I mean, original text. And it, it really, uh, really gives the core of the thing. The question always is, uh, who wrote it? We don't know. Uh, behind door one is Luke, door two, Barnabas, door three, Apollos, uh, door four, Paul. Uh, we, uh, it's speculation. Uh, there's good indication of any of those, uh, but we really don't know. Chapter three is basically around the heavenly calling. And uh, as you look at that, we're going to be looking at the Son is faithful and believing and being faithful, and do not harden your hearts. Ida, what would you consider hardening your heart? How, how does that happen? I mean, does a person say, I'm not going to do it? I think es essentially how I interpret that is to say that when I feel God or the Holy Spirit speaking to me and, and trying to lead me and guide me, me ignoring them and uh -huh. saying, eh, I don't want to do that, and okay. can't do that, too much effort, whatever my excuse may be, I, I just believe that it's simply when we turn away and we don't listen to him and don't obey him, and then we gradually hear, you know, him being God or the Holy Spirit leading us less and less because we have hardened our hearts. Okay. But I can hear people saying, I, can you hear God talk to you today? What about that, James? How do you hear it? I, I've never heard the voice of God, but I have definitely been reading and understood what he was saying to me through actions of other people, mm -hmm. people saying things to me. I know people that got, they've heard the voice of God saying things to them, and I believe them. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's how God chooses to communicate with you, and um, uh, I, I think it'd be awesome if God just suddenly started talking to me, and, but and, it hasn't and it's happened. it's not necessarily an audible voice when you do hear it. It's kind of a sweet whisper. I would agree, and, and I d thank you for clarifying that. I don't want to mislead anybody. It's not that I sit around and have an audible conversation with God yeah. and hang out with Yo, Him. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes I do. I, I do yeah, the audible I'm, part. <laughs> I've been guilty of that, too. Hey, um, God, are you paying attention? But I find that He communicates with us, as James had said, in very different ways. He may just put a really strong... Um, leading and guiding on your heart. For instance, I just recently moved and uh, I felt like one day it was just such a strong urge that I'm going to just get in the car and I'm going to go look in this area. And he brought a house to me within a matter of hours. It was done. Uh -huh. And I would have never in a million years thought to look there. I credit that with God because uh, of the way it all transpires. And when I walked through the door, uh, the owners were like, I don't know what it is, but there's something about you I like. And I said, that's God. That's my favor. And, <laughs> and um, I just, you know, it's those things. It's that urge. It's that small, steel, quiet voice. Sometimes he uses people, and, and the person themselves don't, don't typically know. But something they say just resonates deep inside, and you just get that confirmation in your mm -hmm. spirit from God that says, mm, that was meant for you. You better pay attention. Explain the passage uh, in the Old Testament if you can think of it right offhand. I can't, or I hope one of you can, 
of where the, I, I didn't hear God in the thunder, and I didn't hear him in the lightning, but I, and I didn't hear him in the wind. What, what was that? Well, to me, when, when I think of the things when I'm going through trouble and I'm having a hard time and I'm not listening, Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to fix it myself. Yeah. Uh, one of the examples that I've heard somebody use is when you're going all the way to the top of the mountain, the first thing that happens when you get to the top of the mountain, you start thinking about how to go down the other side of the mountain. Mm -hmm. but when you get to the top of the mountain, stop and be still and know that I'm God. Sit there for a while mm -hmm. and realize that I made all these things. And for me, I don't do that. Oh, look, my water heater's busted. I have to put a roof on my house. I've got to figure out how to do that. Mm -hmm. Don't stop and say, God's going to provide for something. You know, so that's what you should do. Mm -hmm. But we often are just too busy in ourselves to even think about how to be silent, quiet, and wait to see what God says is going to happen. His mm -hmm. timing's better. Yeah, I, we just finished showing the movie The Encounter, and I would encourage uh, people, if you go on the internet or go on your TV or whatever, rent the movie. It's called The Encounter, and literally it's a story about Jesus uh, who opens a little, has a little diner, and people come. Well, as the movie's starting, they're going down the road, and this girl is hitchhiking, and the, you hear in the background, stop and pick her up. And the phew, guy blows right on by. And you hear the next person, stop and pick her up. And they stop and pick her up. And, and we, you think about that, that, that. Over the years, that's the way he's worked in, in our lives. I remember one time I had just bought a new van. And I, we had ivory-colored velour seats in the thing. Mm. And I went by this guy that was hitchhiking, and he was trashy. He was trashed out. Greasy, just an absolute mess. And, and I just blew right on by. I heard the voice stop and pick him up. And I said to God, <laughs> I was talking to him. I said, uh, uh I said, I got white velour seats. <laughs> he said, I didn't ask you about your velour seats. Go back and pick him up. So I U-turned and I went back and I picked him up. And I took him to where he was going. I didn't just hitchhike. I took him to where he was going. When he got out of the car, there wasn't a speck on those seats. Mm. You know. Now, had I been doing it in the flesh, those seats would have probably been all greasy, but, but uh, he protected those. Time and time again, I could give stories of when I heard that little voice. And that's the not harden your heart. That's the listening to that, to, to, to be faithful. Well, let's go to chapter 3, and, um, and we're going to go uh, uh, down uh, through part of it, and, or through it, and maybe part into chapter 4. We're going to leave the Melchizedek thing to go uh, alone to go for another time. Therefore, holy brothers... Um, why, uh, who share in the heavenly calling, who's that? That's all. Fix your thought on Jesus. That's what you were saying, I to the apostle, the high priest, in whom we confess. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, uh, just as Moses was faithful in God's house. Jesus has been found, and, it, and it's so interesting, in Hebrews, it's Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. He just keeps pointing this out and hammering it home was found greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of the house has a great honor than the house itself. For every house is built by somebody or someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in what God's house uh, testified to what would be said in the future, but Christ is faithful as a son over God's house, and we are his house. If we hold on and uh, in to our courage and the hope of which we boast. And literally, here it is again, and he points it out through Hebrews over and over again, that Jesus is God's Son. Why was that important to the Jews? <laughs> Either one of you. Well, if, you, if we go back to the Old Testament, the whole Old Testament points to the Lamb coming, right. and Jesus' Son coming, right. and proving to them who He is, is what's the point of Hebrews. It's, it's I've got to convince these people who believe so strongly in Moses that Jesus was the Lamb and the and Jesus his son, our God's son, so they can see what the truth is because their eyes are covered. They're they're already hardened. That's the point. They missed it at the miracles. They missed it in his testimony when he said, "I am that I am," and they go, "Whoa! Don't you say that? That makes you God." Uh, they missed it at the cross. Uh, they, they 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 missed it that he was the Messiah today still looking for the Messiah and so this is why he kept saying uh, Jesus he is the Son of God and and when we have a definitive issue like that uh, it is important I do this many times when I'm testifying or witnessing to someone I'll ask them I'll say who do you believe Jesus is and they'll say well he was a prophet he was a good man he was this he was that whatever he was 
but is he the son of God? Well, I don't know whether he's the son of God or not. So that's the definitive point here. Any more comments on this part? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's move on to the next. Why don't you catch us about three verses there, the warning against unbelief, because this, this is the important part that we need to get to the, and as we get down into the hardening of, because of deceitfulness. This is the heartbeat of the third chapter. Okay, who, want, who do you want to read? Go ahead. Uh, you, you, uh, yeah. Okay, warning against unbelief. So as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the desert, where your fathers tested and tried me, and for 40 years saw what I did. That is why I was angry with the generation, and I said, their hearts are always going astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declare on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. Okay, let's do a little bit of history study here. As we look back at this, where your fathers tried for 40 years, what's he talking about there? Uh, uh, for people that maybe haven't studied the Old Testament, what's he doing? He's saying essentially that they really tried his patience and tested his forbearance. Okay. Um, because God was, God was testing them to see where their hearts were and they continually uh, made idols and worshiped and grumbled and complained and sinned against God and really and truly it's a miracle that he provided for them every day manna from the heavens and their shoes never wore out their clothes never wore out and certainly they, they weren't excited they didn't get anything new but I mean they he provided for them it just wasn't the way they wanted mm -hmm. which is is kind of the, the essence of our problem is our expectations they murmured and so do we yes yes we are ungrateful and uh, you know I got to raise my hand and, and you know sometimes yeah, sure. it's, it's very easy to get ungrateful and so I think that that's the whole point that he's saying is, is they really sinned against him through their grumbling, their complaining, through their worshiping idols. And, you know, let's just go back to Egypt. This is hard. This is difficult. God, why have you brought us out here? <laughs> Moses, what are you doing? And, and just um, complaining against them. And, yeah. and he calls us to be faithful. It, it, it said that so much here in the first part. You know, Jesus is faithful. May, Moses was faithful. He wants us to be faithful to him, good times and bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, think, I think what's funny with that, too, is we just were talking about this in my men's study and how we look at the, the Jews in the desert and we judge them as though they're idiots, that mm -hmm. they're, they're so stupid <laughs> and these things they do. And they just had manna. They were wandering around a desert. They didn't have a solid home. They didn't have, you know, they had a lot. If we looked at it with our eyes today to complain about, uh -huh. We have a house and a home and everything he blesses us with and everything he gives us. We have full bellies. We have food that's tasty. And we do the same thing. We say, well, I don't have what I, I expected you to give me, God. I, I, you know, our hearts are actually the same, but we lose sight of that. We have uh -huh. this very judgmental, well, they were really silly running around the desert. And, and what's great about what he's done here with this, the, whoever wrote Hebrews is it's a cliff note version to go back and say, you Jew, you know this stuff. Let's go back to Psalms where that was mentioned previously. The Holy Spirit said it previously that you already believe and show you that's what you're doing is you're hardening your heart. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. For a little bit of history buff here, the uh, Joseph uh, back in the days, we're not. It's not Mary and Joseph. The old Joseph, the Old Testament, uh, sold into slavery into Egypt, became uh, part of Potiphar's. Uh, set up the uh, care for the people. His family came down, and that's where the the Israelite people began to come into Egypt. And for the next several hundred years, they came down and just enjoyed all the bounty. Well, then they ended up being slaves. And it was during that slave time that Moses was called out and said, you know, come lead the children out. As he led them out, there was an opportunity for him to go in the promised land. But because of unbelief, oh man, God can't do this. I, I don't think he can take care of us the way he needs to. Because of that unbelief, they, they had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years until that entire generation was dead. And once that entire generation was dead, except for uh, Caleb and Joshua, they, then they were able to go into the promised land. So that is why he is reminding them here in the ninth verse, where your fathers tested and tried me for 40 years and, and saw what I did. I took care of them. Uh, and that's why I was angry with that generation. It's kind of, man, I, I had every right to be upset with them. So let's go on to verse 12 now and pick up the, shall we say, as Paul Harvey, 
the rest of the story. I do you want to read that verses uh, 12 through 15 or 12 through yeah 15? Certainly. Therefore, brethren, take care lest there be any one of you a wicked, unbelieving heart which refuses to cleave to, to trust in, and to rely on Him, leading you to turn away and desert or stand aloof from the living God. But instead, warn one another every day as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened uh, by the deceitfulness of sin for we have become fellows with Christ the Messiah and share in all he has for us if only we hold fast I'm sorry if only we hold our first newborn confidence and original assurance expectations firm and unshaken till the end then while it is still called today if you could hear his voice and when you hear it do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion okay good and that is the key the niv version says today if you hear my voice do not harden your hearts as you did in rebellion and he's talking to them that again the jewish people hey you rebelled once today don't harden your hearts because that's what they were experiencing that's why the writer of hebrews wrote specifically to them uh one time i was in an evangelistic meeting and uh um and my wife and I traveled in evangelism before prison ministry. And one of the things I saw one time was a person that was, uh, the invitation was being given, and they were so under conviction, they were holding onto the pew in front of them till their knuckles were turning white. They, they were not going to go forward. They were not going to accept Christ. They were not going to repent. And that's the essence of today, hardening your heart. I, 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 I believe Jesus is the Son of God but I'm going to take care of myself. I'm going to fix my own roof. <laughs> yeah. And, and you look at the, at the situations that, that happened and, and, the, and the people that uh, then uh, came along and provided. And you've seen that in your life. God's given you some things along your life, hasn't he? Oh, yeah. And, and I, I think the thing that is being talked about here, be encouraging one another daily as long as it's called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Uh, that's verse 13. Um, and your version was very, you know, poignant. It had a, a lot of remember that, you know, be able to be there for one another and remind each other of the things that are going wrong and how God is fulfilling them. Mm -hmm. Because when, when a new brother gets something that I don't have, I don't envy him. I get to go, God just gave him this great thing. I am seeing the glory of God because he is having something great. And when he encourages me back, it, it just works in fellowship to bring us up and to mm -hmm. not allow us to, to fall into that trap of God's never going to give me that and I'm never going to have that, that opportunity. And God is always going to try to be there to provide for you in a way that allows you to focus on Him. And if we harden our hearts like Pharaoh did, you know, slowly over time, God eventually is going to give up on us. He's going to mm -hmm. say, no, you know what? I was there for you all these times. I'm done being there for you now. Mm -hmm. You have chosen something that I did not agree with. So much so with Pharaoh, he gave him all those plagues to try to change his mind. And Pharaoh just never changed his mind until hardened the point where he hardened his, hardened his own heart until God said, you know what? You had your shot. You're done. You're on your own now. Yeah. You know, I love that analogy. And in thinking about the plagues, uh, the frogs, that, that night he said, you know, to Moses, Moses asked him, when do you want me to pray and I'll get rid of the frogs? And Pharaoh's like, ah, tomorrow. He was, I mean, he really, you, you don't want to get rid of the frogs now? I mean, they were everywhere. I'm so much in my own pride yes. that oh I, my gosh. I'm fine with your problem. It's yes. not really my problem. And that's how we are often. Yes, we get so caught up in it. One of the things I deal with with guys in prison when they're getting ready to come out or gals uh, and they're going, um, the, the scripture that we emphasize the most, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. And it comes from the fact that uh, don't worry about whether you've got your clothes or your food or all that. And I don't know, over the years I have seen so much of that, of God saying, you know, trust in me, I'm going to take care of this. I remember Karen and I one time were uh, looking for another house. We were living in a house that I'd bought off of an auction block for 17000 not the fanciest place you ever lived. And you're, not only was it not fancy, it was, I dreamed for years after that that the, the, the real estate deal fell through and I had to go back there. <laughs> it was that bad. Uh, and, and, uh, but uh, we found a house that we wanted and uh, we began to pray about it and God said, yes, I'm going to go ahead and sign the papers on the thing. 
We signed the agreement on the, uh, to buy the house. We had no money. We took $500 that we had, the last of our money, and made a down payment on the house. But we had absolutely nothing. The old house we sold, we made $50 on. We didn't get much equity out of that house, $50. So here we have a house that we've signed on, and, and we're kind of like, we aren't going to get a loan on this house. This is not going to work out. We're gonna, this thing's going to fall through. We're going to lose our $500. And you know those negative thoughts, the hardening of the mm -hmm. you know, it, This isn't going to work. God's not going to provide for us. An elderly couple, and when I say that kindly, as you look at my white hair, an elderly couple came to us and said, you kids want that house? And I said, yes, we do. He said, well, we'll loan you the money, full amount, 5% interest. And that was when the interest rate was 10%. 5% interest, and uh, you could just make payments to us. And all of a sudden, we're moving into a house. And then about two years later, they said, you know, we need our money back out. We're getting ready to buy another place. So I was able to go to the real estate. So here, all of a sudden, this beautiful home uh, was just dumped in our lap. Uh, why? Because we were faithful to step out on the water to see what God had for us. And you get to share that now. And I This get, is this many years later, and you're still yeah, testifying to it. Yeah, and it's a beautiful home. It's paid for now. And, and God's blessing uh, is, is upon us. So verse 16 begins and, it, and brings that out a little bit more before we go into the first part of the fourth chapter. Uh, who were they who heard the, uh, and rebelled? Were they not all of Moses led out of Egypt? Question mark. And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Question mark. <laughs> was it not those who sinned in the, whose bodies fell in the desert? Question mark. As said, we were... What I pointed out in the story a while ago, verse 18, and to whom did God swear that he would never enter that rest? And this is the emphasis I want to point out right now, is this word rest. Because as we go into the fourth chapter, we're going to pick that word up, that rest, and we're going to look at it in great detail. If those who disobeyed, verse 19, so we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. And let me just say to those who are maybe watching, um, Unbelief will keep you from seeing the things God has for you. God's got a storehouse of things out there for us, and because we believe he can't, daily my wife and I pray, Lord, we thank you for life, we thank you for health and healing, and, and already we're thanking him for the health we've had, and we're thanking him for the healing that is yet to come. What are we moving in? We're moving in belief that after age 70, we're still moving on and, and working for the things that God has for us. Chapter 4, then, we, we need to jump into this, but uh, one couple other things I um, wanted to mention. Uh, 1 Timothy 3, 2 through 3, now the overseer must be above reproach, and it's talking about a husband of one wife, self-controlled, hospitable. 1 Peter 3, 4, instead it should be that we enter the self, the unfading beauty of the gentle, quiet spirit, that as we move into the things of God, there are things of rest, that cause us and help us to be what God has called us to be. So let's go into chapter 4, and let's pick up the first two verses. Uh, uh, James, if you would, please. Sure, and I, I wanted to say something about that, that last group of verses that we just read real quick. Uh, one of the things that I enjoy with that is there's no PC. There's no, I'm going to be nice and say these things nice. Uh -huh. He's pointing out who... Who was the person that didn't listen? Who was the group that didn't listen? Right. The Jews. That. He's, he's slamming it home and saying, whoever the writer is, is saying, I'm not going to mince words here. Okay. Guys, catch up with us and pay attention. You're not going to get rest, just like they didn't get rest, because you're living in your old ways and not believing. So could he say that to Americans today? Because you Americans are not following after me. You're doing your own little thing. You're going after greed. You're going after the biggest house with the open concept. And, and all of that. Uh, um, because and he can also say it. He can also say it for the positive because when we get to the order of Melchizedek, he starts talking to those people as a separate group as well. Right. But both groups are combined it, with this whole message. He's saying to one group, "You guys are directly from this line, so don't not listen." Yeah. You guys aren't from this line, but still, don't not listen. Yeah, you listen. And this is how God's provided for all of you. Uh -huh. And that's uh, I love Hebrews for that. Uh, so. We have not because we ask not. Yeah. So uh, they're in the beginning of four, a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the gospel preached to us just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them because those who heard did not combine it with faith. 
Is that how far you wanted me to go, or did you want me to read that's the, Yeah, that's fine, because they would not enter with faith, and that's, that's because uh, verse 2 says, now we have uh, believed, entered for that rest. And, and uh, so it, with this rest that he's talking about here, you say, is that a physical rest, is that a spiritual rest, or, or is it an eternal rest? Yes. Yes. <laughs> It's all three. It, it, it's all three. I, I love the Amplified Translation, if I may. You. Um, yes, do it. For, for we who have believed, and parenthetically it says, adhered to and trusted in and relied on God. So if you think about what that is really telling you, it's just like James was saying earlier. We get stubborn and we try to do things ourselves. I'm going to fix my problem. I'm going to fix my situation. But when you stand still and know that he is God and say, God, I have just got the biggest problem and, and I know it's, it's nothing for you. You created this entire world. The universe is in, it's, it's no problem for you, but for mm. me, I, I can't do this without you. I need you. Show me the way. Show me how to fix this. Provide for me. You are my provider. I'm standing on your word and believing in you. I'm trusting in you. All of my reliance is on you because my weak human flesh can't do it. So does that help you sleep better at night? Oh my goodness, yes. <laughs> I don't have any problems sleeping. I yeah. mean, you know, and, and I've got my, my things that are in front of me that in my own, I can't take care of them, but God has provided for me for, and I'm just going to say it, 45 long years, and um, he's never let me down, not once, not even once, not even close to it. He's always been there for me and got me out of the jams that I got myself into and showed up and showed out. And that's the physical rest. And uh, I, I know guys uh, inside the wall have told me many times when they're coming up to their parole case or they're coming up for another court date or uh, a situation with a family member that has passed away of how, uh, and I've done the same thing over my life, something's on my mind and I'll roll in my bed half of the night. Mm -hmm. I, I can't get to sleep. It just goes over. That story runs and runs and runs. So that's the physical rest, the spiritual rest. Um, let, let me catch this verse 3. I think that'll answer a little bit more here. Uh, now we who have believed enter that rest, just as God said. So I will declare in an oath and in my anger they shall not enter the rest. That's what he said earlier. And yet his work has been finished since the, the creation of the world. He's had it all under control. Uh, for somewhere it is spoken in the seventh day, those, and on the seventh day God rested from his work. So there is a physical rest. There is a spiritual rest. And there is an eternal rest. Well, we're running down just within a couple of minutes here. Give us a wrapper on what you see all of this to be. Well, I, when, when I think about the number of times that I, I don't want to say make fun of, but when we go back to the story of, of, of Jonah in the whale, coming out of the whale, then going to the place, then talking to the people, them all coming to salvation, and then him getting the tree and the tree being eaten, I make fun of that, but then it happens to me. I get given a van, and the next week I'm worried about something else. How, how does that happen? How do we not remember and remember and remember and remember every moment of every time that he helps us? But it's a turning, committing it again and again You have and to again. come back every moment to remember, God took care of this other thing. Why are you thinking he can't take care of this? Or whenever we have, uh, uh, wow, I can't remember who it is, uh, versus all the, the followers of Baal, you know, God brought down a pillar of fire and destroyed them all. And the very next day, he's terrified of a woman looking mm -hmm. for him in the forest. God just wiped out all your enemies. Why are you so afraid? This happened yesterday. And I do the same thing all the time. God will provide for you. He'll figure out a way to help you. That's it. Don't believe Satan's lies. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time we've been in study. And Lord, I just pray for the guys, gals that are watching uh, if they do not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, that they will ask you the, to be in their lives as the Son of God. Teach us your will. Teach us your way. In Christ's name we ask.